Hey everyone, welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean and today I want to talk about all the books that I read in February. And you're just going to have to pardon the glasses and the mess of books behind me. I couldn't be bothered to figure out the lighting in the other room. Um, so we're rolling with this. Um, but February was a pretty good month for me in terms of reading, though I spent a lot of time reading one big book, Gormenghast, and I also read the first half of The Books of Jacob by Olga Tokarczuk. So that's where a lot of my reading time went. So I read perhaps fewer books this month than I usually would have. But it was still a pretty good month, and I did read quite a few books that I'm, I'm in between doing a full review and not doing a full review. There's a few books that I've read that I don't think I can be bothered to do a full review, but I do want to talk about it for quite some time. So this video will have timestamps down below if you want to jump around, but I'll just go through the books in the order that I read them. Once again, just to, I don't know, for continuity's sake or something like that. And the first book that I read was, I started the month off uh, in a quite grim way. Uh, the first book I read was W.G. Zebald or Sebald's On the Natural History of Destruction, which is a collection of essays or lectures. I'm not sure how many of them were written to be lectures and how many of them were just essays. I don't know how many of them were performed as, as lectures, um, but it collects four essays and it's really a grim book that looks into the absolute destruction of Germany during World War II. It looks particularly, at least in the first two, uh, in the first two essays that I'm going to focus on here because those are the ones that I think I got a lot more out of. The second two essays, the last two essays, focus more on writers and other German authors that I haven't read, so I couldn't really fully understand what he was getting at. But what he focuses on in these essays is the destruction of Germany during World War II, the bombings and fire bombings of all of these German cities. And he basically argues that German authors in the post-war period haven't fully processed this event or these events and this destruction. He argues that a lot of post-war German authors sort of ignore this trauma or elide over this trauma. And essentially, he argues that we need to focus on it and we need to, as, as Germans I'm speaking, I guess, um, they need to focus on it and gaze into that abyss in order to process what they just went through. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dead civilians. But what he does in these essays, especially in the first few, is go through and catalog and describe in immense disturbing detail the aftermath of these bombings. And I'll spare you the details, um, though I have tons of pages marked that just have some of the most grim uh, descriptions of war that I've ever read, except for another book on this list that we'll, we'll get to. Um, but he, th there's one instance that has stuck out with me where he talks about this Swedish journalist who came to Germany after the war um, to do journalist stuff, I don't know, write an article or something. And this journalist takes a train between these two German cities and it's like a half hour train ride. And the journalist talks about how he felt like he was on the moon because it was, it was like a lunar apocalypse that he was riding through. And throughout his entire ride, he never saw another living soul outside of his window. And while on the train, all the other people on the train were just watching him. And they realized or they knew right away that he was a foreigner because he was looking out the window. He was looking at the destruction around him where all of the German citizens that were on the train with him refused to look at it. And that's essentially what Sebald argues in this book. And that's essentially what he does. He looks out the window while he argues that all these other German authors haven't looked out the window. And so this is very Sebaldian in a lot of ways. I mean, if you've read any of Sebald's fiction, um, this is kind of what he does, where he gazes into history, gazes into this cultural trauma and tries to explore it and extrapolate from it um, in some really interesting ways. So if you're interested in Sebald, I actually think this is a pretty good place to start. I mean, it's not fiction, which is what he's more known for, but he has that exact same pro style. He's probing the exact same sorts of cultural trauma and cultural memory that he does in his fiction. Um, it's a pretty harrowing account, honestly. Um, and again, the, the first essay specifically, um, which is quite long, it's like 100 pages long, um, is, well, some of the most brutal war descriptions that I've ever read. It's some of the most brutal writing that I've ever read. Uh, it's really a, 
it's really a grim book, but it's a really important book because it's something I didn't really think about too much either, right? All, all these fire bombings in, in Germany, we often um, think more about the Blitzkrieg in London or the, you know, the fire bombings of Tokyo and the uh, atomic bombs in Japan in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, but yeah, this kind of opened my eyes to, to, to an entire world that I didn't know that much about. And apparently um, there's a reason why I don't know that much about it. And it's because people don't talk about it that much. Um, really good little book, really good little collection of essays. The next book that I read was also by a German, um, by a deceased German, um, Old Rendering Plant by Wolfgang Hilbig. Hilbig is an author that I think is having a bit of a renaissance right now. Um, Two Lines Press specifically um, are putting out a lot of his books. Um, and Isabel Fargo Cole is the one who translated this book, um, as well as some other ones. And the reason I actually picked this book up was because last summer or last fall, I forget when, um, Two Lines Press put out The Interim by, by Hilbig. Um, and it's a little bit longer. So I, I thought I would start with this short book. But another reason why I've been reading um, I've been wanting to read Hilbig is because I've just been seeing his name pop up so much on Twitter and stuff like that. Um, Ryan Has Bad Taste, who is one of the hosts of the Volmania podcast, which is a fantastic podcast on William T. Volman. Um, they just had their first episode. He's been talking a lot about Hilbig on Twitter. Um, he actually wrote an article, um, a, a very, very good article on uh, the interim, the, the other Hilbig book that I want to read. Um, that was great to read, but it made me want to pick up this book first. Um, and this book is very much a extended monologue. It focuses on this guy who goes to this, this basically old industrial plant called Germania II. Um, and he goes and explores it a little bit, but while he's there, he remembers back to when he was a child or a young boy, and he would explore this exact same plant. And when he would go as a child, it was this magical place for him, right? It's, it's like this really interesting like juxtaposition between it being very run down, but, but for a kid, I mean, a nice run down place is, is the best place in the world because it's full of magic and adventure. But so when he was a kid and he remembers back to this, and a lot of this book takes place in his childhood and we keep jumping back and forth between when he would explore as a kid versus when he's exploring it now. But when he was a kid, he would explore it. And back then it was a coal plant, or at least he thought it was a coal plant. It actually held something a bit more sinister inside of it. But on the facade, it was just a coal plant. And then very quickly in the early pages of this book, something bad happens to the kid while he's there. And he begins to realize how dangerous this place is. And so a lot of this book is actually sort of an allegory for East Germany. Um, and it's an allegory in a lot of ways that, again, I'm not that familiar with the history of, of East Germany kind of post-World War II, um, but it's clearly doing an allegory. But much like Sebald, it's very interested in trauma and kind of cultural, personal trauma and cultural trauma, and also history and how we reckon with history and how we often, uh, you know, elide over the parts of history that we don't like or we suppress it, but how we kind of need to focus on it if we ever want to fully process it. And I think my favorite part about this book is the imagery. The imagery in this book is absolutely insane. Um, it's absolutely beautiful, but it's also very much like Sebald, grim, gross descriptions of, of broken buildings and broken bodies and all of these dead bodies. I mean, the descriptions are very haunting. They're very gothic, very much about decay. They're very Krasnohorkai in a lot of ways, actually, in that very post-industrial uh, state. But there, there's one, one part that I, I mean, I could read from pretty much any page of this, any page of this small book, um, and you could get a lot of this imagery, but I just wanted to read one where um, he, he's looking down at, the, at this old factory um, and the ground has kind of begun to swallow up this ruin, right? It's kind of falling apart and sinking into the ground. And it just reads, down there silence had fallen. A bubbling had faded, a hissing that had come from below as though a row of glowing boilers had been doused with water, a resounding hiss that had mounted to the clouds, a seething and boiling that howled and thundered down to the depths, a jet of flame sinking a second later into a hole that had spewed one last eruption of incandescent water, froth, cascades of high-flying sparks, several, bright several brief volcano-like jolts, a tormented bellow of irreconcilable elements violently forced to flow together, for the earth had gaped open and sucked both fire and water down the narrow maw of a leviathan in whose bowels the substances mingled. And it goes on, but this, 
description I just love of this, of the earth being a leviathan, just eating everything up as everything is decaying and falling into the earth. Um, and that's actually something that we'll see in a few other books that, that I read this month. Um, but by the end of this, by the end of this novella, even the, the memories are falling apart as the old rendering plant is falling apart, but the language starts falling apart in some really interesting ways. This is towards the end, but let me just read this very brief moment uh, because it's very, I mean, it's very joicy in a lot of ways, but the language just starts decaying in some, in some ways that I found, I found very compelling. Old rendering plant, starry stuttered river round, old rendery beneath the roofs of baffled thoughts, baffled clatter of old proved thoughts, old pretendery, thoughts thought by night, star studded, old clattery, the constellations covered, and clouds, old noise, smoke brain beneath the cloud brow, windy roof of cloud racks cover the stars. And it goes on. I mean, I, I could keep going. It's very much like like Krasna Horkai or Thomas Bernhard, where you don't actually, you don't you never, never know when to stop as it just keeps going. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the prose in this is just wonderful. The imagery is, is beautiful. It's a pretty depressing book and it's full of decay and, and falling apart, but I think it's a really good book and I'm very, very excited to read more Hilbig. And the next book I read was by a Norwegian writer um, who I really like called Dag Solstad, uh, and it was Shyness and Dignity. I've read quite a bit of Solstad. Um, I don't know if you can see, but I have a few of his other books. Um, but I was reminded to read this book, well, one, because my lovely wife bought this for me for, for Christmas. Um, so you always got to read the books that people gift you. Um, but another reason was because Leaf by Leaf just did a video on the essays by Lydia Davis. And Lydia Davis actually, very interestingly, um, decided to learn Norwegian and learned Norwegian because of Dag Solstad. Dag Solstad has this Norwegian book that isn't translated um, called the, the Telemark novel. That's what people call it. It has a very long title that I don't actually know, um, but it's like a 500 page novel. And Lydia Davis was so struck by Solstad that she picked up that book and read it and taught herself Norwegian as she went. Um, so Dag Solstad is, is a Norwegian writer who is very famous in Norway um, and he's very respected in Norway. Um, and he's someone that I think deserves a lot more attention. But Shyness and Dignity, much like his other novels, just focus on unremarkable men. And these men are often academics or teachers. Um, in this case, uh, Elias, the, the, the main protagonist, is a teacher. And he's wholly unremarkable in a lot of ways. But one of the reasons why I, I love this book is at the beginning, we have this very long description of him teaching this uh, Ibsen play, the, the wild duck, to this um, class of high schoolers or secondary schoolers. Um, the kids are like 13, 14, 15 or something like that. Um, and it has just some of the best descriptions of teaching that I've ever read, and especially the, the negative parts of teaching. Um, while he's teaching uh, this, this play, Elias, the protagonist, has this like moment of realization. He has this epiphany moment where he understands a character in the play. I mean, I haven't actually read the play, so I'm sure if I read the play, then I would have understood this book a little bit more. But he has this epiphany moment. And he has this moment of brilliance. And he begins explaining this to all of his students. And he keeps looking out at his students and his students just look entirely bored, right? They either don't know what he's saying or they don't care what he's saying. And anyone who has taught for any amount of time has experienced that feeling Hopefully only once or twice, though more likely quite a few times, as I, I certainly have felt that. But this feeling of futility as he's teaching this great work of art and the kids just don't care. And he sympathizes with the kids quite a bit in this book because why would a 13, 14, 15 year old care about Ibsen, right? I mean, if, again, if you're American, you've had, you had to read Shakespeare in high school. Should a 15-year-old or 16-year-old kid care about Hamlet? Probably. Will they? Probably not. But so we get all of these long descriptions of, of his thinking process as he's trying to get through to these students while realizing the futility of doing it. Um, and there's just one passage, or there's a bunch of passages that I really like, uh, but here's a small excerpt. He had even been amused at the thought that his teaching bored the pupils, thinking, well, such is life, that's the way it is, and it must be to teach in secondary school in a civilized country. 
The very thought of the contrary situation sufficed to make one quickly understand how impossible it would have been if it had not been the way it, it is, the, the, the way it, as a matter of fact, was. Just try to imagine what things would be like if the cultural heritage awakened an enormous enthusiasm among the coming generation, so that they devoured it greedily, because it had because it had both the questions and answers to what they had secretly been preoccupied with, a sweet thought in a way, but not if one considers the reality of the situation, namely that it is a question of immature people with a rather confused, incomplete, even at times directly commonplace emotional and intellectual life. It, it's so good. I mean, it has this, this irony, uh, this, this satire, this sardonic tone throughout this entire book. Um, and, and that's really where Solstad's prose really shines, is, is in portraying these, these men who, unlike in a lot of books that focus on unremarkable people, his characters, Solstad's characters, never become heroes by the end, right? This isn't like in John Williams' Stoner, where by the end, Stoner is the hero of at least his own story. Here, it's never really the case. But so this book goes on. I mean, it focuses on his teaching. Um, this guy's a secondary school teacher. It focuses on his teaching for the first bit. Um, but then something happens, um, and Elias begins remembering to, uh, these stories about his wife and about his one of his best friends um, when, when, when he was a young man. I um, mean, we get a lot about their relationship. But I just love the, this character's outlook on life. It's so it's so familiar um, to me. There's just one sentence a little bit later on that I just love, where he, where he just says. He attempted a condescending smile at life and at his own role in it, but could not bring it off. It's so good. Um, I love Solstad, and I, I can't wait to read more of his stuff. But I, I'd, I'd recommend this if you're interested in um, contemporary Norwegian literature or interested in Solstad. I think this is a pretty good place to start with Solstad. It's quite short. It's only about 150 pages. Um, but it's a good place to start. I'd recommend it. The next book that I read was Do Everything Wrong. XXX Tentacion Against the World by Jarrett Kobeck. This is a book that I just found out about the other day. Um, Mark Nash on YouTube here made a video about uh, how Jarrett Kobeck is the best living author that you've never heard of. Uh, and Kobeck just put out this novel, very Evan Doris style, where he just released it without any fanfare. Um, so I was immediately interested. I'm always interested in authors who are reclusive, who people don't really know that much about. Um, so I was looking through his catalog and he had this book. And this might surprise you, I don't know. Um, I really liked the music of XXX Tentacion. Um, I thought his music was very good. I have very distinct memories actually of my very first semester teaching, um, uh, college at least, I, I taught high school for a little bit. Um, but my first semester teaching college, I remember <laughs> walking to class every day, not every day, but at the beginning of the semester, listening to um, XXX Tentacion's uh, question mark. Uh, or question album, um, and it was just like this weird juxtaposition between blaring XXX Tentacion in my, my headphones and then, you know, turning off my headphones and walking into a classroom and teaching writing to a bunch of college freshmen. Um, I don't know. I thought it was kind of weird. Um, but I, I, I quite like XXX Tentacion, and this book I actually thought was really good. Um, it was a really compelling look at X's life and at the sort of culture that produced a character like XXX Tentacion. Um, I mean, on, on the back, you know, it, it just says 20 years of life, 27,000 tweets, 171 pages of sympathy for the devil. Basically what Kobeck does in this book is he goes through all of X's tweets. He, he actually went through X's tweets, put them all in an Excel document, printed them out, and there were 27,000 of them. Uh, and then just read through them in chronological order. And from that, he pieces together X's life and his rise to fame and, of course, his death. If you don't know who XXX Tentacion is, um, he was a complete no-name rapper who rose to success when he was about 17 years old, um, skyrocketed the charts with a few songs, and then very quickly um, he got into a lot of trouble for a lot of his behavior, which... Uh, Kobeck doesn't ignore. Kobeck directly addresses, um, you know, he was allegedly um, accused of, of beating his, his, his pregnant girlfriend in some very horrific ways. Um, and X's behavior is pretty bad in a lot of ways. And of course, at the age of 20, you know, right at the height of, of, his, of his success, he was murdered. Um, he was shot in the neck. 
Um, so his career came to a, a halting stop. Um, but what this book does that I think is so interesting is that it looks at it looks at American society through the lens of XXX Tentacion and looks at how X is a product of a society that has all sorts of problems. And a lot of these problems are kind of manifested in this very young man. Um, there's, a, there's a moment early on where he basically, where Kobeck basically explains what this book is going to be about. And he writes, this then is the story of XXX Tentacion's early life. It isn't the litany of suffering that is mandatory in every biography. It's a story of how systemic influences in a society shape and create the contours of an individual. And it starts with the governmental conspiracy to put several generations of black men into prison. And the pathology that this conspiracy has wreaked on the children of those black men, the constructed behaviors, and the hypocrisy of a society that tolerates unspeakable crimes from its highest elected officials, but brooks no forgiveness for the sins of its poor. It's a story about a kid who gets a call from his father and raps for jailbirds. And it's a story about someone breaking out and crashing back in. And I won't talk too much about the details of, of X's life, but this book goes through, um, you know, looking at the criminal justice system, the, the war on drugs. Um, you know, if you read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, um, you can see where this is going. Um, but it also talks a lot about the internet and internet culture and also the music industry and music culture. But I found the discussions around the internet to be so interesting because, of course, X became so popular on, on SoundCloud. Um, so he was very much a product of the internet. He didn't come through traditional music labels and stuff like that. He came through the internet. And he was very famous for tweeting all the time, right? He has 27,000 tweets. He was a product of social media. So X is really a, a symptom of America, a symptom of the internet. Um, and this book explores that quite fully and in some really, really remarkable ways. And um, He's actually, there's a lot of allusions in here, or not a lot, there's a few that are indirect and a few that are direct. Um, allusions to uh, Rimbaud, the French uh, poet who is very mythologized um, in the history of Western poetry um, because it's, well, because his poetry is quite good. Um, but I found this connection between X and Rimbaud to be so interesting because Rimbaud as I'm sure you probably know, um, was this French poet who wrote almost all of his stuff between the ages of like 15 and I think like 18, maybe 19. Um, he wrote all of this poetry and then he never wrote another poem again. He went to Africa and, and did all his other stuff. Um, but he was a very destructive, very controversial poet. Um, and in some ways, and I, I don't want to make this connection uh, too explicit because I don't really want to compare the lyrics of X to the poetry of Rimbaud, very different mediums. But in some ways, these two lives were very similar in that X led this rock star lifestyle where he was getting into fights all the time. It was He was a womanizer. He was all of these different things. And there's a way in which Rimbaud was very similar, but we don't look that poorly on Rimbaud. We just think, you know, he was an angsty kid who got into a lot of trouble. Whereas this young man is completely demonized. And there's a way in which if X was born into a different time period or into a body with a different color skin, we might not think of him that way. And so this book doesn't try to redeem X in any way. It doesn't elide over his behavior. It doesn't ignore any of his behavior. In fact, it, it condemns a lot of his behavior, but it looks directly at it and tries to figure out where it came from. And I think it does an, an remarkable job doing it. But yeah, so if you're interested in, in XXX Tentacion, if you're interested in much larger issues of, of race in America, of the music industry, of hip hop specifically, but of the music industry as a whole. If you're interested in the internet and how that has affected American culture and especially American youth and especially young men, um, I think this is actually a really, really good book. I read it in one sitting. It's really quite short um, because he writes in this, in this very kind of simplistic prose that sort of mirrors um, X's tweets in, in a way. Um, but I, I thought this book was really good. I was really blown away by how uh, astute and how critical it was uh, of, 
as a look into, into all these different forms of culture. Um, and I'm definitely going to be picking up more Jarrett Kobeck. Um, I have a bunch of his other books either here or on the way. Um, and I'm very, very excited to read them because uh, if that book is any, anything to go off of, he's a very good writer. The next book I read was The Orphanage by Serhi Zadan, whose name I'm probably mispronouncing, I apologize. Um, this is a book that I have been debating making a full review of, um, but I don't think I'm going to because I don't want to because one, I think it might be tasteless. Um, uh, Zadan is a, a Ukrainian author who in this book just looks at the war in Eastern Ukraine around you know, 2013, 2014, 2015. Um, and this book is just one of the grimmest looks into war in a modern city that I've ever read. Um, and I actually started reading it a few weeks ago uh, before Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, and then as soon as Russia invaded Ukraine, I had to put the book down and I had to, I, I stopped reading it for like three or four days um, because it was way too real and I, I didn't like reading it anymore. And that's why I, I don't know if I want to do a full review of it um, because this is one of the most unabashed gazes into war that I've ever read. And it has some of the most brutal war scenes that I've, I've read in a book. But yeah, what it's about is this man who is in his mid thirties named Pasha, who is a school teacher um, and war breaks out. And essentially what he needs to do, he's tasked by his, his father to go pick up his nephew, who his brother, Pasha's brother, left at an orphanage on the edge of the city. Um, and it's kind of unclear why uh, he was left there, but um, his nephew is this young, young teenager, right, in his mid-teens, and Pasha is tasked with, with going to get him. So it's a very simple quest narrative. Pasha just needs to go, pick up his nephew, and then return home. But of course, the city that he's in, which is in, I believe, the Ludansk re region, um, somewhere in eastern Ukraine, one of those cities, and uh, it's an active war zone. And so he travels through this post-apocalyptic, or not post-apocalyptic, because the apocalypse is happening, this apocalyptic landscape of this city as there are bombs going off, as there is military uh, you know, invading, there, there's, there's gunfire in the streets, and he has to navigate this, this whole this whole world to go get his his nephew. And so in some ways it's it's almost like a, a bastardized version of James Joyce's Ulysses, right? Instead instead of instead of Pasha wandering around the city, um, that is exactly what he's doing. But of course there's a war going on. So he's wandering around the city while while bullets fly over his head. And Pasha is a really interesting protagonist as as he is a very unassuming man. He's, he's, he's a school teacher. He doesn't care about politics. He's very apolitical and he gets yelled at for being apolitical, but he, he isn't a hero at all. And he has to go through this landscape and meet with these people and negotiate with them and figure out if they're, if they're allies or if they're enemies. And it's almost, I mean, it reminded me in some ways of The Walking Dead as he keeps running into these groups of people and he doesn't know if they're Russian or Ukrainian, uh, what side they're on, who they are, if they're gonna betray him, but he has to figure out how to work with them. Um, and he meets all these interesting characters and these interesting uh, people who, a lot of the time, they're not even given names. He just will call them um, you know, by a, you know, a, a defining physical feature or something like that. But there's something to that, that he doesn't even have time to recognize these, these individuals as individuals. He just needs to work with them so then he can get on to his quest. Um, but what this book does so well, and by well, I mean effectively and heartbreakingly, is describe war and describe the absolute destruction of, of modern cities. And I, I won't read anything that's too, too bad because again, like some of the stuff in here, especially reading it right now, um, is, I mean, just absolutely disturbing. But there's one scene that I, I do want to read because I particularly like this description. Um, and I think this will give you a, a, a taste of what kind of descriptions you'll get in this book. Pasha is looking out over the city. All he can see is a black pit. Hovering above it is thick black smoke with long tails, like the strings on kites. And it's as though somebody's pumping souls out of the city. And those souls are black and bitter, 
snagging on trees and taking root in basements. You just can't rip them out. And over there, far away, on the other side of the city, something's blazing, sprawling across the horizon, like scalding lava coming out of the ground. There's a sound of automatic gunfire coming from the city itself. And it goes on, but I mean, this is essentially a, a perfect mix of, of Hilbig and, and Sebald from earlier in my month, um, as, as the imagery and the descriptions are absolutely harrowing. And actually, I almost forgot, uh, this image recurs just a few pages later um, in a way that I really like. Um, so let me, let me just read that very quickly. It just says, they can't see the city, but long black streams of smoke are rising from over there. They, they, have, been, they, they have been since yesterday. It's as if the ground has, has been ruptured, and now something truly terrible is coming out of the earth, and nobody knows how to stop that something, the worst thing, since nobody knows how it happened, how the earth split and released all its blackness, which is now creeping across the January sky and filling up all its cracks and openings. I mean, that, that, that is so similar to the description in, in Hilbig of, again, the earth I mean, in this case, releasing all, all of this all of this smoke and then kind of like consuming the people. And so, yeah, I mean, this book is, it's, it's a great Ukrainian novel, but it's very much a Ukrainian war novel. And I mean, again, it's very, very harrowing to read, but I think it's very, very pertinent, um, especially right now, of course, I mean, obviously. Um, but there, there are passages in here that I won't read, I'll spare you, um, where uh, Pasha tries to remain apolitical. And the characters that he meets, um, you know, will ask him his politics, where his allegiances lie. And he'll respond by saying, I don't care about politics. And what he doesn't realize is that being apolitical is a political move. And usually being apolitical actually helps one side. And that side is usually the fascist side. So, yeah, I mean, this book is incredible. I would highly recommend it. I would wait to read it, to be honest, because, um, I mean, again, this this is very, very difficult to read, but, I mean, what an incredible work. I, I, I immediately ordered um, Zidane's, he has, no, he has a few other books, um, but one is called Mesopotamia, and I plan on reading that soon, because his prose and his imagery and his metaphors are gorgeous, if harrowing. The next book I read, which I'll try to go through a bit more quickly than the last few, was Shirsty A. Skomswald's The Child, which just came out. I, I ordered a copy and I got like a, a bound proof. Um, I don't know. Uh, but it was, just, it was just, just came out last year, I believe. Um, but this book is was quite interesting. Um, I like Skomswald. I've read her... I'm trying to find it. Oh, they're behind the plant. Uh, the Faster I Walk, The Smaller I Am, um, which is also quite short. Um, and it's quite good. And I'm really interested in reading. She has a much longer auto-fiction work called Monster Human um, that I'm very, very interested in reading at some point. Um, so she is a pretty popular, pretty famous Norwegian author. Um, and, and this book is really, I think, one of the better descriptions of motherhood that I've read. And it reminded me quite a bit. Last month, I read Drifts by Kate Zambrino, who at the end of that book um, talks a lot about motherhood, about being a new mother and the sort of psychological damage that it has on, on you as, as, as a mother. Um, and this book is doing a very similar thing. And this book also seems quite auto-fictional, though who knows where, where the, you know, if it even matters where the, the difference between fact and fiction lie. Um, but yeah, so it's very much about the, this young mother who um, uh, has this, this baby um, and her relationship with this baby and the relationship with her husband, whose name is Bo. And so, yeah, as she has this kid, her she begins kind of reflecting back on her own life and on her own relationships and starts seeing how they've changed and how how being a mother now has changed all of that. Um, and it's 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 quite interesting. I mean, it was very, very short. It was another book that I read in one sitting. Um, but... I quite liked it. Again, I'm, I'm always interested in books about motherhood because obviously it's something that I can never really experience. Um, and one of the reasons why I read is to experience things that I can experience. Um, and I think this did some some really interesting things with this as it looks at the the nuances of motherhood and the 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 psychological damage. I, I don't want to keep saying damage. I don't want to always be uh, pointed in a negative light, but the, the psychological effect of of being a mother. Um, of, yeah, of all of that. 
I think it's quite good. Um, I, I, I think it's worth reading. I think she's a, a writer that I'm always interested in uh, her, her books that, that are coming out. She is kind of up there for me with Hanna Ustavik and Vigdis Hjurth from Norway as writers that I'm always, I'm always looking up to see when Martin Askin, who is always translating all these books, when he's translating the next book. All right, and just two more books. The next one that I read um, is Memory of Water by Emmy Itaranta, who is a Finnish author. Um, and this book was actually written originally in Finnish, and then she rewrote it or translated it or something uh, into English. So there's no translator because she's the translator. Um, and this book is something, um, I've spoken about this before, but I, I want to get more into Finnish literature. Um, and, and this is a Finnish book that has kind of broken out into the international scene. Um, and it's very much a speculative fiction story, kind of sci-fi-ish. Um, but basically it takes place in a near future, um, in this world that has been ravaged by climate change. So it's very eco-critical. And it takes place in Scandinavia, in what is now called the Scandinavian Union, in a world that is dominated by um, this Chinese empire. But essentially what has happened was, uh, after the almost destruction of the world uh, due to the oil wars, which... Uh, I mean, <laughs> we're still going through right now. Um, there was a second war on water, and that war on water, or the, the the water wars, is still going on. So it's a war that's ravaged by war and by the military is everywhere. But it's a world in which there is almost no more fresh water. So everyone needs to ration out fresh water, and so all the water in the world is controlled by these separate military uh, units. And so we follow this young protagonist whose name is Noria and she is the daughter of a tea master and so they have this tea ceremony that is sort of a holdover from the old world um, and her and her father are are always hosting these people and of course they need to use their water very specifically to to host um, these tea ceremonies and very quickly we, we realize that uh, her father is doing something quite dubious and and quite kind of treasonous um, in order to get more water. And so she's thrown into this world. Um, this book I, I thought was quite interesting. I'm glad I read it. Um, it's compared to Ursula K. Le Guin quite a bit. Uh, and I think I can see where that comes from with the speculative fiction. Though Ursula K. Le Guin always deals with these big ideas, but then she also deals with um, a lot of like subsidiary ideas where she's always playing with gender and sexuality. Not that those aren't big ideas, but they're, they're always almost secondary in her books. And uh, Itaranta doesn't really do that. She only is kind of focused on this much bigger idea of climate change and eco-criticism and these water wars. So I thought this was a fun read. Um, you know, it's quite short. Again, I read it quite quickly. Um, I thought it was fun. If you're into speculative fiction, I think it's worth checking out. I just don't think that it has like the density of ideas that someone like Ursula K. Le Guin or, um, even like Octavia Butler, uh, who I should have on my shelf right behind me, uh, who, or even, uh, speaking of people on my shelf, uh, Margaret Atwood, th these kind of authors that, that have, I think, just a bit more, more, dense, uh, more densely packed ideas in their speculative fiction novels. Um, still quite good, would recommend it, um, but not my favorite book that I read this month. And then the last book that I read, um, or that I was reading while reading all these other books, is Gormenghast by Mervyn Peake, who I, I have already made a video on this. Um, and this took up a lot of time. I mean, this book is long as hell. It's like 950 pages, um, but it's quite uh, dense as well. It's, uh, I mean, it's probably like a 50 hour book, uh, maybe 40, 45. Um, really, really good. I, I don't know why I read this this month. I became interested in this book a few months ago. And then I just randomly picked it up. I mean, I was already reading the books of Jacob, so I don't know why I then picked up this monster, but I absolutely loved this book. It was such a surprise. It has everything in fantasy that I like and has none of the parts in fantasy that I dislike. And I've spoken about this before on the, on the channel, but the thing that I dislike most about modern fantasy is, is the prose style, is that I find that a lot of authors, there are very few authors, who take prose seriously in fantasy, who really care about the minutia of, of syntax and, and, and diction and all this different stuff. Peak, like Tolkien, just excels at prose. And I won't read any snippets here. Actually, 
No, screw that. I'm, I'm going to read one snippet um, just because I, I think it's actually really good. Uh, it's at the very beginning of the second book. It's the opening of the second book, which isn't really a spoiler, um, but I guess it, it, it might be considered it. But I mean, this is just this is just the opening paragraph of, of book two. And it's just in, it's incredible. Titus is seven, his confines gormangast, suckled on shadows, weaned, as it were, on webs of ritual. For his ears, echoes. For his eyes, a labyrinth of stone. And yet within his body, something other, other than this umbragious legacy. For first and ever foremost, he is child. I mean, you, you just don't get writing like that in most books nowadays, um, especially uh, books that are marked fantasy. Um, this book was incredible. I mean, it has just some of the most unforgettable characters. But yeah, I mean, I, I spoke about this already. All of the characters in this are so unforgettable. I mean, Mr. Flay is probably one of my favorite characters as he starts off as being, well, a complete nuisance. And then he evolves into something so much more. Um, every single ca ca character in this has so much life. Um, it's, it, it's so good. I, I could go on and on. Um, but Gormenghast, um, definitely the book that surprised me the most as I wasn't expecting to like it. I was expecting to put it down after the first book, um, but it, it sucked me away into this world. Um, and I mean, I flew through this book in just a couple of weeks. It's incredible. And so, yeah, those were the books that I read this month. I'd be interested if anyone else has read any of these books um, uh, to leave a comment down below uh, because I want to talk more about these books. Again, there were a few of them that I debated on doing a full review of, um, but decided against and thought I would just speak more at length here. Um, but if anyone has read these books and has any thoughts on them, I'd, I'd love to extend this conversation into the comment section. So let me know what you think. But for now, thanks for watching.